Henry Kutze, welcome in front. And if you want to know more about him, please uh, open page 116. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in April 1999, when the first group of ground hornbills were reintroduced on Mabula Game Reserve in Limpopo, it started raining. It was kind of an unusual time of the year to get rain in that part of the world. But what made an even uh, bigger impression uh, on me was uh, when some of our colleagues pointed to the ground hornbills and said it's because of those birds. And uh, it's something that stayed with me for many years. And then finally, uh, last year, thanks to a grant from National Geographic, I got the opportunity to do an in-depth study, uh, you know, to really get the understanding of why ground hornbills are used in traditional practices. And uh, today I'm here presenting a grounded theory explaining the use of the bird uh, in traditional practices in South Africa. So the use of the southern ground hornbill uh, is perceived as one of the threats to its conservation status. Um, the bird's international uh, conservation status is currently listed as vulnerable, uh, but in South Africa it's uh, endangered, maybe uh, critically uh, endangered. Uh, if you look at the existing literature uh, on uh, uh, how to approach this kind of uh, national uh, conservation uh, challenge, unfortunately it doesn't provide much assistance except for uh, some aspects of the more classical approach used by Cunningham and Zondi and the slightly more new liberal approach uh, that Man uh, Miles Meander that's also yeah, followed uh, in the understanding uh, they study to try and uh, understand the dynamics of uh, vulture use in uh, traditional uh, practices. In most other cases, research on the topic remains uh, fragmented or only focus on isolated aspects such as the type of species used, uh, the potential impact of traditional medicine uh, on species or biodiversity in general, or it repeats anecdotal beliefs, practices in a very basic uh, descriptive manner. Internationally, uh, it's more or less the same, except they also focus on ethnozoology uh, topics like bioprospecting. Uh, In our opinion, uh, they all basically fail uh, to voice the actual conservation issue, um, namely what should be done or how should we approach this uh, challenge. Uh, in our opinion, again, uh, the first and uh, most obvious step should be an in-depth exploration uh, of the topic. Um, you know, since the use of animals and plants is sort of fairly complex and multi-dimensional, um, we also need an approach uh, that um, will be able to identify the, the uh, factors contributing to the use of a particular species, uh, also the strategies followed, in other words, the actual users, understanding that, uh, as well as the factors that might lead to the influ uh, that uh, may influence the outcome of these actions and also influence uh, future users or strategies. And uh, the, the last aspects are particularly important to try and come up with some kind of uh, intervention, if needed. Uh, I must say as well. In addition, uh, knowing, like I said, knowing uh, the uh, underlying reasons uh, for uh, certain animals or, or for the use of certain animals and plants in traditional practices may also provide an opportunity uh, to intervene uh, in a manner that is both pragmatic and also culture sensitive. So the purpose uh, of our study was to gain a deeper understanding uh, of the southern ground hornbills use in traditional practices and uh, basically uh, trying to answer the following uh, central questions. Uh, is the southern ground hornbill used in traditional practices? If so, what are the dynamics of the birds used in traditional practices? And how should uh, this ph um, phenomenon be approached um, to affect the birds' conservation? Methods we use, we use the grounded theory strategy uh, in which we try to develop and explore themes we coded and inductively grouped these uh, categories as they emerged from our data. So basically meaning that we didn't think of or came up with this theory of how it's used and where and when and that sort of thing. We really relied on our data to inform and help us develop this theory for its use. 
um, we'll then develop a working hypothesis, something we tested with our participants, we, we came up with ideas, you know, every time we thought, okay, now we have sort of a good understanding uh, why the bird is used, and then we'd go back to our participants, ask them, is this why you use the bird? And they'll say, yes or no, and then we use that to refine uh, our understanding of the phenomenon, just based on symbolic interaction and wisdom. Uh, we followed the ethical guidelines provided by our university's uh, ethical uh, committee. Uh, study species, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, southern ground hornbill. Um, it's the largest hornbill species and the uh, lo um, largest flighted uh, cooperative breeding bird uh, in the world. Uh, it occurs in uh, South Africa, uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, um, up into Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, southern parts of Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo. So basically, most of uh, southern Africa. Uh, it basically it occurs in uh, large groups. Like I said, they are cooperative breeders, and they basically uh, spend most of their time, 70% of their time, uh, walking uh, in search of food, and uh, they basically eat anything they can overpower up to the size of hares. Um, they've got a long average lifespan. 50, 60, even more years. Uh, they uh, take many uh, years to reach sexual maturity, in other words, before they can start breeding. And they've got uh, a fairly low uh, reproductive uh, rate, uh, all of which make them uh, particularly su uh, susceptible to uh, human-induced uh, threats. Uh, all other aspects, I'm not going to go uh, into the details of ground on bi biology and ecology. It was reviewed by Kent, if you want to read more about them. So we conducted our research at Faraday a Traditional Medicine Market in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, it's the uh, largest wholesale traditional medicine market in uh, Central South Africa. Um, uh, Ten uh, um, participants took part in our study. They were all uh, qualified and practicing traditional uh, healers. Um, they were mostly from this province, KwaZulu-Natal, uh, or the Eastern Cape. Uh, one of our participants were from Zimbabwe, and the other participant were from Mozambique. Uh, the ages. Uh, we basically uh, obtained our data by uh, asking uh, each participant three questions. We showed them a picture of the ground hornbill, and we asked them uh, if this bird is used in traditional practices. Uh, also, um, you know, to tell us basically what the, the bird is used for. And then, uh, depending on their answer, we ask a couple of follow-up questions to further explore, um, you know, uh, themes and stuff as they emerge. Uh, we then transcribed data, uh, went through various sort of coding and data analysis procedure, open coding, actual coding, selective coding, uh, etc. Trustworthiness, uh, study is fairly trustworthy. Uh, results. Uh, I think this is the most important, uh, the most interesting part. So, why are ground hornbills used in uh, traditional practices? Uh, firstly, in terms of the context, uh, we found out that uh, the bird is used uh, mostly by communities in the northern, eastern, and southern parts of South Africa uh, during the summer months, uh, during times of severe drought, or on special occasions. They are used. Uh, for a couple of uh, different but very specific reasons. First of which is to bring rain, you know, when, in times of severe drought. Uh, also as protection against lightning. And also to make lightning, you know, if you don't like your neighbor so much or his crops is better than you, you know, you can always arrange to, to go and take care of that problem. Uh, also to give uh, their local leaders a deep voice. You know, those of you that know the ground humble will know that they have a deep so, so they are used to give leaders a, a deep voice that shows authority. Um, and then uh, they are also uh, used to instill personal strength and courage uh, as protection against evil spirits. So it's not really physical strength, it's more uh, a bravery, you know, that sort of uh, thing to, to withstand the, the onslaught of, of evil spirits. Uh, good fortune and luck, also not in terms of, of money, but more as good luck and also to foresee the future, which I'll talk about, because so this morning uh, someone said that they are they're not aware of any surrogates for vulture use, and I think I have one for them. 
All right, uh, causal conditions, basically what caused them to use the bird in the first place, because uh, I think uh, we need to know that. So the first uh, reason why, what led them to use the bird in the first place is uh, cultural values, beliefs, attitudes, um, and if we look specifically in terms of uses, like to bring rain. So they believe that uh, the bird can uh, foresee or foretell when it's going to rain. You know, the, the birds, they call when, when it rains. So they believe, okay, the bird is calling so, and, and it's going to rain, so they know when it's going to rain. Or they know when lightning is going to strike. So that's why they, they use the bird uh, for that. Uh, also, rain. You know, you, you can say what you want. Uh, rain is uh, important to, to people because uh, no rain be, uh, means uh, t t to many people no food. Um, leading to starvation, uh, lightning, uh, you know, as protection against lightning. Lightning is a, is a reality, you know, especially in KZN, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, get killed by lightning uh, every year. Um, also, uh, local leaders uh, needing power, you know, a lot has changed in South Africa in, in the last uh, couple of years. People becoming more westernized, you know, if you look at uh, your traditional um, uh, authorities and stuff, uh, you know, there's, there's a shift and there's a uh, change in dynamics there. Uh, also people needing uh, personal strength and then uh, also perceived control. Um, all right. Uh, then if you go and look at... Th th this, this tells you one thing, you know, on a sort of very superficial level, but what you really need to do is, is, go, is you need to go and look at the underlying reasons. So the question is actually really, why do they really use the ground hornbill? And then if you go and look at that, you'll realize that um, it's driven by very strong collectivistic worldviews and very strong emotions like fear. Yes, people should be fearful of lightning. They're getting killed by lightning. So how do they um, take care of that? They use the ground hornbill to protect themselves against lightning. So... That means that if you go and look at the, the consequences uh, for the users while they use the bird, you know, it, it, it helps them survive and cope, you know, with these natural phenomena stuff that they normally don't have power. So it, it gives them power because all of a sudden, you know, they have some sense of uh, control. So it basically empowers them by giving them that little bit of control over these uh, stuff that they normally don't have control with. Now, if you go and put all of this together, and you ask yourself, uh, should, two questions, should we intervene and how should we approach it? In other words, how should we go about doing it? Now, in terms of the ground hornbill, uh, we also found that the bird is protected by uh, local cultural beliefs and values. Uh, for example, uh, healers will tell you that uh, people are, you know, won't just go out and kill ground hornbills. You know, they are used uh, for for very specific reasons. Uh, they will also tell you that, you know, if we see a boy that wants to kill a bird, we'll stop him, we'll tell him don't do that. There are also some traditional um, punishment systems in place. For example, if a person uses a ground hornbill to give himself a deep voice and he's not a leader, his cattle will be taken and, and burned. And uh, it sounds like a bride to me, but he won't be allowed to, to take part in the you know, eating the meat and stuff. So, the, so there are some systems in place. And then also uh, we find out that the knowledge about the bird is uh, fairly specialized. You know, it's not even uh, among traditional healers. Um, you know, um, not everyone knows, you know, all the details about how to use them, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, then also uh, South Africa, you know, we haven't experienced any sort of severe droughts in the last couple of years. Um, the fact that the ground hornbill has become less available in the wild, you know, people, you know, the whole idea of out of sight, out of mind type of thing, so um, people don't, don't use them that much. Um, what I mentioned earlier, communities are becoming more westernized, uh, processes like acculturation and inculturation, you know, people are not carrying that traditional beliefs and knowledge over from one gen generation to next, or they, they don't believe as much in their cultural they're just becoming more westernized. Um, also, uh, the user's general willingness to adopt new species, we, we, we found out that. And then uh, also uh, interesting and something that we're focusing on in the future is the 
the availability of surrogate species. Uh, in other words, other animals and plants that are used for similar reasons uh, than the ground hornbill. So, uh, I think from the research it's clear uh, that the bird um, is important uh, and then that people's uh, interactions with the birds have shaped in their perceptions and beliefs and this in turn has led to their use uh, in traditional practices. Uh, understanding the context, uh, you know, provides valuable information for the planning uh, for intervention. Uh, the association with rain, lightning and thunder um, is something that uh, that you find across most parts of their range, the, the association with rain. Uh, also to foresee the future, um, you know, to look into the future, uh, that, that's also uh, something that's fine all the way up to Tanzania. Um, to give uh, leaders local uh, voice, we found that you even get it as far up as Malawi. Uh, the strategy to give a person uh, strength or courage is that the only use that we found that's sort of fairly restricted to South Africa, but then again, we haven't done any detailed work in the other countries. And this basically makes uh, our research uh, applicable and uh, important or relevant to most parts of Africa. Um, I think what is uh, clear to me, or to us in any case, is that um, you know, the use of the ground hornbill um, is motivated by strong uh, psychosocial uh, undertone um, and you know existing interventions if you, if you ask yourself the question you know how should we deal uh, with it uh, if you look at uh, existing interventions for example those that were proposed for for vultures uh, for example won't work because they don't address these sort of underlying reasons um, another uh, opportunity is uh, to try and uh, change cultural beliefs but uh, changing people's beliefs in general is is very complex and you know not that easy another option is attitudes but uh, in this case i don't think uh, the attitudes um, are the problem uh, a better option in our opinion is to try and address um, you know this use in uh, alternative uh, manners uh, for example uh, in South africa all lightning strikes are monitored so you can get a look at things like early warning systems uh, or you know in combination with other tactical stuff like um, lightning conductors uh, and then of course a surrogate species you know using alternative species now in terms of surrogates and this is uh, actually the sort of next phase of the project so what I presented here was was the results and now we're moving over into to uh, intervention because although we found that the use of the ground hornbill in South Africa is probably not such a big issue and I'm pretty sure that the impact thereof uh, is, is, is not really significant. But uh, during a recent survey in Zimbabwe and Mozambique, I found the birds there at market suggesting a different set of dynamics and that it is commercially traded in those countries. So as alternative for rain uh, that, that is used in, uh, uh, in, instead of ground hornbills, they, they talked me about the plant called Msenge. Does anyone know Msenge? Is that Oh, can you please tell me what it is? Because the, the, the healer said, oh, okay, Masenge. And then everyone said that. And, and then I said, do you have it at the markets? No, but it just grows you. I'll go and show you. And there, there weren't time. And uh, do you know what, which plant is it? What's it's the species. Cosonia. Yes. Oh, really? Okay, which one? Okay, because he said it, it, it was in Gauteng. And he said it grows in that, that hills near Southgate. And that actually makes sense because I've seen Cosonia there. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that. And then in any case, there's a whole ritual where, where young women uh, is used in a ritual, and that's the clay they use, you know, uh, with this msenge plant to go into the river to, to make rain. So there's alternative. Then also as protection against lightning, uh, depending on who you talk, uh, you know, there's different uh, recipes, if, if you can call that. There are some overlapping species, for example, uh, marula. Sclerocarnabaria is, is used. That's one of the species I've been able to identify. I must still identify most of the other ones. Uh, and then, of course, this one. I don't know if anyone knows it. Uh, that was given to me uh, by one of the healers. And that is used as alternative against uh, protection against lightning. So they'll, they'll bite off a piece and then go like that. And what's that? Go away, you know. Is it a seed? No, it's a bulb. I'll show you afterwards, in any case. 
All right, so, but we'll, we'll send them to our lab for analysis, so we should know what all of them means. But also, you know, it's a little bit early to say, but I, I get the feeling that the specific species that are used are not as important as the sort of symbolic meaning of why certain species used. For example, uh, in terms of the C4, what, what is the, the, the tree that you see when you walk in a bush, you know, far away? It's uh, the fever tree, you know, you can see it from far away. So that is used to C4, and that is also used as an alternative uh, to vultures, the, the reason why vultures are used. Okay. So, conclusion, uh, I think it's, uh, it's it more or less, uh, like I said, I think I've, I've covered everything. But, uh, yeah, I, I think this uh, just shows that, uh, you know, if, if you really understand... What, what is happening in the dynamics that we can come up with with methods that are pragmatic, practical, using what is already there instead of going in and saying, listen, what you are doing is wrong, you're not allowed to use this. Ground Humboldt has shown us that they are used for very specific reasons and I think the challenge is to try and come up with innovative ideas on how to, to uh, address these needs in, in other uh, uh, ways, you know, that is culture sensitive and, and solves the problem. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, this is People in Conservation, Henry Kutte from Northwest University. Just one question or comment quickly from the floor. Yes, I mean, what what uh, methods are they use to capture um, birds they use them? Yeah, it's actually very interesting. You're the second guy that asked me that today. Um, 